It's my great pleasure this morning to introduce you to Rabbi Deborah Brin, who will be our speaker this morning. She is currently serving as a spiritual leader at Nahalat Shalom, a Jewish renewal synagogue in the North Valley, and I hope she'll tell you a little bit more about Jewish renewal and what that means. She was born and raised in Minneapolis, where she attended the conservative synagogue which her grandfather founded. Her mother was a well-known Jewish liturgical poet, and her family was steeped in their faith. Deb majored in religious studies in college. While there, she heard a rabbi say, women aren't really Jews, they just give birth to the next generation. And you can imagine that made her intensely angry. And so she started a group of Jewish women who taught each other to do all the things women were not permitted to do in conservative Judaism, to read from the Torah, to lead prayers, and to give the homily. She met a woman rabbi as a part of this group. The first women rabbis had been ordained in the Reformed tradition in 1972. She decided to go to rabbinical school herself, took a crash course in the Hebrew that she hadn't been taught as a child, and she went off to the Reconstructionist Rabbinical School in Philadelphia, and she'll tell you more about that, too. She was amongst the first 100 women to be ordained a rabbi, and she says has been, she's been privileged to change what liberal Judaism looks like throughout her career. She was also in the first generation of lesbian rabbis. Her first congregation was in Toronto. When she was there, she was the only female rabbi in Canada. <laughs> Upon returning to the US, she worked as a hospice chaplain and a campus, campus chaplain. At Grinnell College, she was the advisor to all the odd ones, Jewish, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Hindu, and Muslim. It's kind of a wonder you didn't, um, weren't in charge of us you use at Grinnell College, too. <laughs> all along, she's been involved in feminist Jewish activities. Last year, she received an honorary degree, Doctor of Divinity degree, from her rabbinical college for 25 years of service to the Jewish community. She's lived in Albuquerque twice now and made major contributions to the Jewish community both times. Congregation Nahalat Shalom has thrived under her leadership during the last five years. And during that five years, she's also been a part of an interfaith clergy support and prayer group, which I'm also in, and it's been a blessing to me to have um, Deb in that group. Her partner, Yael, had a law office right across the street here for a while, and they used to walk through our patio on the way to the Chinese restaurant regularly, so they feel at home here. Welcome back. Welcome, Yael. We're glad to have you with us, too. And for a reading this morning, I want to share with you a piece of the liturgical poetry of Ruth Brin, who is Deb's mother of blessed memory. No one ever told me the coming of the Messiah could be an inward thing. No one ever told me a change of heart might be as quiet as new fallen snow. No one ever told me that redemption was as simple as springtime and as wonderful as birds returning after a long winter, rose-breasted grosbeaks singing in the swaying branches of a newly budded tree. No one ever told me that salvation might be like a fresh spring wind blowing away the dried, withered leaves of another year carrying the scent of flowers, the promise of fruition. What I found myself trying to tell you, redemption and salvation are very near, and the taste of them is in the world that God created and laid before us. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Good morning. When I applied to rabbinical school, I was supposed to tell them why I thought I qualified to be a candidate for the rabbinate. 
It was completely natural for me to discuss my candidacy in light of the generations who had come before me in my family. My grandfathers and my father were all community leaders, movers, and shakers. And my grandmothers and my mother were all powerful, highly educated women engaged in what we now call social justice work. My mother worked to establish early childhood centers in one of the Native American neighborhoods in Minneapolis. And both of my grandmothers worked tirelessly to rescue as many Jews as possible from Hitler's genocidal machine. Irma, my mother's mother, helped to settle refugees once they arrived in Minnesota. And Fanny, my father's mother, was a nationally known peace advocate who was nominated as an alternate delegate to the discussions that founded, with great hope, the League of Nations. Her favorite saying was from the Talmud, quote, Rabbi Tarfon used to say, you are not required to complete the task, neither are you free to desist from it, end quote. It seemed to me that becoming a rabbi was the fulfillment of my inheritance from them. From generation to generation, in Hebrew, is Lador Vador, and that is a critical concept in Judaism. Where did you come from? Who are your people? What are you passing down to the next generation? As Reverend Robinson mentioned, I grew up in Minneapolis. Both of my grandmothers were college educated. One graduated from Vassar College in 1907, and one graduated Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Minnesota in 1906. My mother grew up in St. Paul, and my father grew up in Minneapolis. What they had in common was a strong Jewish identity, a high value on education, and a similar class background with parents that were highly involved in communal matters, both Jewish and general, as well as local and national. I tell you this because despite Jewish identities that were profound and crucial to who they were and how they lived their lives, as children and young adults, the content of my parents' Judaism was very different. I used to joke that my parents were intermarried, my mother's family were German Jews who belonged to a reform congregation. My father's family were Eastern European Jews who belonged to a conservative congregation. My mother grew up in a home where her father had ham and eggs for breakfast. My father grew up in a kosher home. That is, all of the traditional food laws were observed. The prayers in the reform prayer book my mother used were mostly in English with only a few phrases in Hebrew. The prayers in the conservative prayer book that my father grew up using were done in Hebrew with the transli translation on the opposite page, but English was very rarely used. My father went to Harvard and my mother went to Vassar. They used to meet in New York City and one day my father got off the train with a copy of Mordecai Kaplan's book, Judaism as a Civilization, under one arm. This book was the first of many that expounded his ideas of what later became Reconstructionist Judaism. My mother, always the intellectual, was intrigued, and whenever they could, they attended Kaplan's synagogue, the Society for the Advancement of Judaism. It was there, about 20 years earlier in 1922, that Kaplan's daughter Judith had the first bat mitzvah ceremony, that is, the first coming-of-age ceremony for a girl that was ritually and intellectually equivalent to that of a boy's bar mitzvah. It would take decades before that innovation would become normative for girls in North America. Fast forward. The rabbis who came to Minneapolis after World War II to serve the conservative synagogue where my father grew up and that my parents joined together after my father's discharge from the army had all studied at the Seminary of the Conservative Movement, the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. While there, they were greatly influenced by the ideas of Mordecai Kaplan, who was the professor of homiletics. 
Kaplan espoused a philosophy and way of thinking about Judaism that at that time was still within the realm of conservative Judaism, but later would become a separate movement called Reconstructionism. Kaplan's ideas made it possible to creatively maintain the traditional ways, customs, and rituals while letting go of the burden of following Jewish law uncritically. He said that, quote, tradition has a vote, not a veto, end quote. And when he combined his cr incredible knowledge of traditional Jewish laws and observances with his modern sensibilities in order to put a new twist on customs and practices, he called it transvaluing tradition. The creation of the bat mitzvah ceremony, he had five daughters, is a case in point. The requirements of learning and accomplishing traditional Jewish synagogue skills of chanting the weekly Torah portion, leading the prayer service, and giving the drash, the teaching on the Torah portion, were all the same as for those of 13-year-old boys. What was different was that those privileges were extended to a female child. This is in stark contrast to the practices of the Reform Jews, who from the inception of their movement in Germany in the 1820s jettisoned everything about Judaism that they thought was in the way of their being seen and respected as full-fledged citizens by their Protestant neighbors. They eliminated Hebrew from the prayer services and used the German vernacular instead. And they got rid of the bar mitzvah ritual for boys, substituting instead a confirmation ceremony for both boys and girls at age 16. My childhood. I had a bat mitzvah in 1966. In preparation for it, beginning in fourth grade, I had to go to after school Hebrew school three days a week and Sunday school and attend junior congregation on Saturdays. And about eight months before my bat mitzvah, I took special lessons to learn how to chant from the weekly prophetic portion called the Haftorah. One Saturday morning in junior congregation, the cantor came in and asked who would like to learn how to chant from the Torah. I raised my hand along with some of the other students, apparently all boys, although I hadn't noticed it at the time. The next day, my mother got a phone call from the synagogue. The message was this. Well, Mrs. Brin, I suppose we could teach your daughter to read Torah, but you must realize that she will never be permitted to chant from the Torah scroll. Needless to say, I did not learn to read Torah as a child. My congregation was liberal in other ways. Although women's roles were clearly delineated and ritually unequal to men, creativity, music, and making things meaningful were all encouraged. My mother began writing poetry that interpreted the weekly Torah readings. They were read aloud in my congregation every week, and it literally gave a voice to women's issues and interpretations of tradition. Over time, her poetry was published in the prayer books of the three largest liberal denominations in the United States, Reform, Conservative, and Reconstructionist. Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, the founder of Jewish Renewal, who you may know of from his work, Aging to Saging, read some of my mother's poetries in the late, poetry in the late 50s or early 60s, and they began a correspondence. They didn't actually meet one another face to face until many years later. Zalman, who is my teacher, still reminds me that in his view, my mother was doing Jewish renewal before there was Jewish renewal. When I was in college, I struggled to come to grips with my emerging feminism as well as my sexual identity as a lesbian. It seemed to me at the time that I had to choose between fitting into my Jewish world or fitting into the lesbian feminist world, and I saw no middle ground where I could be all of who I was. I was angered and enraged by the traditional attitudes about women, confused and frightened about what it would mean to live my life as a lesbian, and very unhappy in the lesbian feminist world trying to downplay my Jewish identity and my class background. 
In the mid-70s, a women's minion began gathering at the University of Minnesota. A minion is the number of people required for a quorum in order to say some of the daily prayers. Traditionally, a minion is 10 adult men, and once a 13-year-old has had his bar mitzvah, he counts as a part of the minion. Declaring a group of women to be a minion at that time was quite radical. We experimented with God language, which in Hebrew means using female forms because Hebrew is a gendered language. We wore prayer shawls, considered by tradition to be garments worn only by men, and we taught one another to chant from the Torah and lead the prayer service. The first woman was ordained in the United States by the Reform Movement in 1972. I entered the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in 1979. When I entered the Rabbinical College, it was fine to be a woman. But if they knew that I was a lesbian, I would be expelled. That, thankfully, changed long ago. But for me, it dominated my reality as a rabbinical student. When I was in rabbinical school in Philadelphia, I lived a few blocks away from where Zalman Shachter Shalomi, the founder of Jewish Renewal, lived. He lived on the third floor of his house with his family. The second floor were the offices for his nascent movement, and the ground floor was where we gathered on the Sabbath and holidays for services, had classes with Zalman, listened to his stories, and shared in potluck meals. It was in response to the complaints and challenges of his women students and followers that Zalman changed the name of the Philadelphia organization from Bene Or, Sons of Light, to Pine or faces of light. How huge a difference it made for women in the renewal movement that Zalman changed that one letter in the name of the movement headquarters in Philadelphia. Through my stories about some of my own and my family's experiences of being, of being Jewish, you are getting a taste of modern liberal Judaism in the United States. All of these varieties of Judaism that I've mentioned in my narrative began after the European Enlightenment. Reform Judaism began in, the, in Germany in the early 1800s. Their goal was to be a Jew at home and a man on the street. That is, it was fine to be Jewish at home and inside the Jewish community, but in public, they wanted to be undistinguishable. They wanted to be seen as German citizens and not as Jews. Orthodox Judaism started as a reaction against those progressive reformers. They sought to uphold tradition, adhere to traditional Jewish law and customs in all domains of life, both at home and in public. The conservative movement arose in response to the traditionalists and the reformers placing themselves squarely in the middle which, where they remain today. They said to the reformers, you're right, we need to change. And they said to the traditionalists, you're right, we need to maintain tradition. With the rise of Jewish immigration from Europe in the mid-1800s, Jews brought these and many other ways of being Jewish with them. Reconstructionism and renewal are both movements that were created in response to circumstances in the United States. Reconstructionism began after World War I, addressing the immigrant generation who wanted to shed their, their old world Jewish rituals and customs as fast as they could. Jewish renewal began in the 60s, addressing the generation that grew up after World War II and the Holocaust, the generation that sought to tune in, turn on, and drop out. Here in Albuquerque, I serve a Jewish renewal congregation. Zalman is my teacher, and I was ordained at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, so I jokingly refer to myself as a Reconewalist. <laughs> One of the very personal reasons that being a rabbi is important to me is that since I don't have children of my own, it is my way of participating in Lador Vador, in being a part of the chain of transmission from generation to generation. A few years ago, a family came to my synagogue. They wanted their two daughters to become bat mitzvah. They schmoozed a while and decided to join the congregation. At the end of the conversation, the mother of the girls turned to me and said, 
do you know someone named Fanny Bryn? I said, yeah, she was my grandmother. A stunned look came over her face. She said she got my mother onto the kinder transport and saved her life. A few years later, I had the privilege to help prepare her daughters for their bat mitzvah ceremonies and to officiate at them. Unbelievable. Zalman says that coincidences are God's way of making miracles happen anonymously. <laughs> Listening so attentively as you have, it may have occurred to you that I've mentioned many things that are important to, to Judaism, but that I have left out any reference to God, except for one small exception, that we were experimenting with God language in the women's minion. Rather than speak about God, which tend to be one of those things that liberal Jews avoid talking about, I have focused instead on the importance of family tradition, rituals, prayer services, holiday celebrations, and coming-of-age ceremonies, prayer books, Hebrew and prayer shawls, Jewish laws and customs, Jewish identity, communal life, and who counts in a minion. I've mentioned creative interpretations, transvaluing customs and traditions, reconstructing, renewing, and innovating from within. In short, the variations and varieties of Jewish practice that arose in response to outside influences that were eventually internalized within the community, these responses became the movements known as Orthodox, Conservative, Reconstructionist, Renewal, and Reform. Perhaps the sign outside announcing the title of my sermon today should have had a question mark attached. Liberal like you? My understanding of Unitarian Universalism is limited, and yet from my vantage point, I do see similarities with liberal Judaism. Primary among the similarities as I see it are our common dedication to democratic principles and process, commitment to building and sustaining community, and the insistence on fighting within our society and the world at large for social justice, equity, and equality. We share a hunger for meaning, learning, and asking questions. Jews are actually known for answering a question with another question. Where your religion incorporates and integrates ideas and practices from many traditions, ours distinguishes that which is outside and not Jewish from that which is inside and considered to be Jewish. Mordecai Kaplan taught us that Judaism does evolve and change over time, and that Judaism is different in different locations and time periods because it is highly influenced by the outside cultures it finds itself in. I'll give you two examples of this thousands of years apart. The first one is the form of the Passover Seder, the ritual dinner on the first two nights of Passover. It was consciously created by the rabbis of the Talmudic period as a teaching device to engage the younger generation so that our core mythic story, the story of redemption from slavery in ancient Egypt, could be taught. It was modeled on a secular custom from their contemporary Hellenistic world, the Greek symposium. The so symposium began with a vegetable appetizer dipped in salt water, included the custom of eating while reclining on pillows or couches, and ended with a dessert entertainment referred to in a Greek word, epikomen, that sounds remarkably like the Aramaic word, afikomen, the hidden piece of matzah that must be found to end the Seder. A more current example of Judaism's ability to be syncretistic, that is, to absorb and incorporate the thought, customs, and politics of the day, is the ordination of women. The concepts of Jeffersonian democracy, feminism, and the politics of identity have all impacted and been integrated by modern liberal Judaism and resulted, among other things, in the ordination of women, lesbians and gay men, and now transgendered individuals. 
our hunger and search for meaning and spiritual fulfillment within community and our drive to work for social justice may be the same. For us, being liberal still has boundaries and lines of demarcation where my perception is that for you, the search is far more open and the boundaries between what is us and what is other are far more permeable. We also share the value of being concerned for the well-being of our neighbors and fellow citizens. The Jewish version of the golden rule is found in a story in the Talmud. A Gentile came to one of the rabbis and asked that he be taught all of Judaism while standing on one foot. That rabbi soundly rejected his request. The man went to another rabbi named Hillel and asked the same question. Hillel replied, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. All else is commentary, go forth and learn. I hope that you have learned enough today to be intrigued and will, as Hillel said, go forth and learn. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you today. <laughs>